Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Bowen, Executive Director for USTA Florida, and I'm happy to be back with you as we celebrate Women's History Month here in March. And I have a very special guest with me here today. I have Trish Faulkner, who is the USPTA Vice President and Master Professional, and she also is the USTA Florida Foundation Board Member and the chair of our diversity and inclusion committee. So thank you, Trish, for joining me today and for all the things you do. Well, thanks, Lauren. It's great to be here. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about Women's History Month. Uh, you have such a great uh, perspective on women in tennis, and I thought maybe we could start by having you share a little bit about how you were first introduced to tennis and the path that you followed that brought you to us and where you are today? Well, I was born in Sydney, Australia, and we lived behind a tennis court with a wooden fence. And I guess I used to peek through the fence because I could hear the plop plop of the balls. And my parents played a little bit. My father was in the army at the time we were living with my grandparents. And so they said that from about the age of two and a half, all I ever said was bat and ball, bat and ball, bat and ball. I drove them nuts. So I guess uh, my father, who was head of the uh, rugby union in Australia, was very much into sports and played and did a lot of different things, swam competitively. And so in Australia, you know, we do a lot of different sports. But um, by about the age of six, I think they started to put me into lessons. And uh, the coach was nobody special, just a local guy. But he was a very, very, very good coach. And he really did a lot of repetitive stroke reproduction. And uh, I have, everybody tells me, great style on the court, which I thank you very much. So, but thanks to George Filewood, who was my coach from a very young age. And I think I started playing tournaments about eight or nine. And uh, I did very well. So I progressed through the junior ranks uh, at the state and then the national level. I was Australian junior doubles and mixed doubles champion. So, that sort of kick-started me onto maybe trying something a little further afield. And of course, when you live in Australia, it doesn't mean you go away for a couple of weeks. It means you go away for quite some time. <laughs> it's a pretty far away. <laughs> it is. And uh, so I was also Australian junior squash champion. So I played, much to my tennis coach's horror, um, a lot of tennis and squash at the same time. So um, I have a little bit of a risky forehand, but. Uh, um, it kept me very fit. So I actually went away on the Australian squash team to London. And then from there, I sort of moved into the tennis tour as it was then, uh, with no prize money and lots of fun times, both men and women together. And uh, I played there for three or four months. I had a return ticket home and I called my parents and I said, I'm really having a good time. And I think I can get a job at Harrods in London to sustain my, my winter. So. Um, I stayed and that was sort of it. I, that's how I got into it and that's how I started playing the competitive circuit. And what brought you here? How did you end up to the US and to Florida eventually? Well, I married an Englishman and he was then after we got married, uh, came home and said, guess what? I got promoted and I'm moving to Detroit. And I went, oh really? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I knew it was a cold place, but Anyway, tennis is tennis. You meet people everywhere on the court. So we moved to Detroit. I lived there for 18 years. And that's actually where I got my start teaching tennis. Um, I joined and got my certification from USPTA. And I still played uh, the tournaments. I went back and played some of the tour, mainly in England and Europe, not too much in the States at that point. And then in 68 and 69, I had my two sons. So that sort of kept me off playing for a while. And uh, then I played again in starting in 1970 and did very well, actually. In 71, I got to the quarterfinals or no, round of 16 of the US Open. So um, that was the first year that I ever won any real money. Um, I wish I'd won it now. I'd be sitting here in uh, my palace, right? But Yeah, you wouldn't be talking to me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I... Um, my doubles partner at the time was Vicky Burner from Canada, and she got a job with USTA running the satellite circuit. And she said, we're expanding. Would you be interested in being a tour director? And I said, well, gee, I have some young kids at home. I can't travel too much, but yes, I would. 
So I did that for a number of years and then uh, WTA hired me full time. And uh, they said our head office is in Florida and my boys were old enough and lived with their dad at the time when I went to Florida. So that's how I ended up in Florida in, uh, let's see, I think I moved down in 83. Well, thank you to WTA for bringing you here to Florida because now we benefit greatly from the fact that you are here. Well, I have um, to say that Florida is a lot more like Sydney, Australia than Detroit was. I, I can imagine that that's probably true. <laughs> Although I will say Michigan is a beautiful place in the summer when it's warm, yes. uh, very, very pleasant up there. Uh, but winter, uh, there's no place like Florida in the winter, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I, I enjoyed all my uh, club affiliations up there, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, it's a very, very active market, obviously, up there, and they have some great coaches. So I, I used my time wisely in Detroit. As I said, I got certified up there. I also played for the Detroit Loves for um, a year and a half. So that was a great experience. So I, I enjoyed my time in Detroit. Obviously, as playing, I saw some wonderful women players, um, particularly at the time, Maria Bueno, when I was playing, was absolutely the most graceful player. Maybe Yvonne Gulligan came close, but Maria Bueno was absolutely magnificent on the court. Um, and obviously, in her Ted Tiddling dresses, she looked um, exquisite. So I loved watching her play, and I got to hit with her quite a bit and get to know her. Um, I think Althea Gibson's feet and, and what the challenges she faced, I um, had the pleasure of working with Althea on some different uh, activities in Detroit and also in Florida. And um, she was a very strong, uh, independent woman and I, I admired her tremendously and I enjoyed watching her successes. Um, but then when I worked for WTA, um, watching Martina change from uh, a chubby, uh, Czech player to somebody who really um, made fitness what it was on the women's tour and made everybody catch up with her and the rivalry that she had with Chris Evert and the friendships that they finally formed at the end. Um, um, and I also, I loved watching Steffi Graf's backhand. You know, there are certain things and they had a huge impact on the sport, all of those, all of those women. And I got to know Virginia Wade very well. And I was there when Virginia won Wimbledon. Of course, the British went crazy mm -hmm. and that was a sight to see. So there are a lot of people that um, I have fond memories about, but that I admire um, and a lot of other people in the business side of it as well. But on the tennis side, I loved watching all of them play. And of course, I was close with Venus and Serena when they came on the scene. Uh, they played at my club and I got to watch them practice and it was just a wonderful sight to see the two of them together and watch them on and off the court. It is amazing how many wonderful historical moments women have had in tennis when you look at the sports world as a whole. Tennis has to be up there at the top with, you know, how much great women's history has happened in our sport. I can't really think of another sport that has had so many of those great female leaders and moments. Um, I'm sure someone will tell me if I'm missing another sport, but I just, that's one of the things I love about tennis is I just like to see all of the things that women have accomplished and done. Well, you see that the original nine are going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. I was actually in Houston and obviously I knew Gladys Heldman, our driving force, along with Billie Jean and, and the others. So, yes, I, I agree with you. I think uh, because women's tennis was global right from the start, um, and we did play alongside of men for many, many years when there was no prize money. And then obviously Jack Kramer came along and, and broke up in, in the pro tour and everything. So I think they made great strides, but they had to do it on their own. Uh, other than people like Gladys and uh, Joe Coleman from Philip Morris and Ellen Merlo, who was uh, the vice president of Philip Morris and who really was the Virginia Slims brand and the person that pushed for us with Virginia Slims on the tour. Um, I think we, we had a hard fight and it's people like Billie Jean that just kept on fighting and fighting and, and taking those risks. It was interesting today, um, I think it was today or yesterday, the BBC had had tweeted out uh, an interview piece that they had done with the original nine at that time. 
And when you listen to it, you know, I hadn't seen it before, so I was watching it today, and so many of the same themes that they were fighting for then and they were being asked about then are the things we talk about now. You know, some of the players who had to bring their children on tour, and then there were others um, that really struck me saying they made the choice not to have children because... Well you know, and, and it was really eye opening because while you were watching this uh, video and you knew it was done in a completely different time and culture, you were listening to these women talk about many of the same things, equal pay and, you know, the men not wanting them to be on their tour. And so they went off and created their own. And it, it it's really remarkable sometimes how much things have changed and then how much they haven't. So uh, a credit okay. to the original sign for sure. And uh, again, you know, if, if there had been the money and, and the prestige and uh, the fame that goes along with women's tennis now, if you're in the top 50 at least, right, I, I don't know whether I would have had my two boys when I was as young as I was. Um, I mean, I, I loved my, my life on the tour, but there was not a way to make a living at that point. I had to go back and, and teach or do something. Um, so it, it is, you, you give up a lot. When, particularly when you are totally committed to the sport. Uh, I've had a very long career, so this could take a while. <laughs> but <laughs> That's okay. I, I guess um, just uh, being given the opportunity by my parents to uh, get the fine coaching and to play tennis and then being given the opportunity to go overseas was obviously a big push for me to do well and to try my very best. Um, the first time I qualified for Wimbledon, the very first year that I tried, was exciting because to me Wimbledon is the pinnacle and being Australian I loved playing on grass, so uh, that was exciting for me. I've, I've played there six times I think at Wimbledon. Um, but also I, I think uh, later on becoming a master professional, I should have done it a lot earlier, but I just probably wasn't that well organized with all of the things that I had done. And, and I would advise all the women professionals to make sure that they keep good records and, and um, achieve that status, because it does mean a lot, both to you, the coach, and also to the people that work with you. Um, I think being selected to be on the US teams to play the ITF Cups, that was uh, the first time I always wanted to be in the Olympics. I did a lot of different sports and I was a very good swimmer, but I didn't quite make it to the Olympics in swimming. So I always wanted to be in the Olympics one way or the other. And so just being representing a country, uh, I think meant a lot to me. Uh, I think there are different springboards to you know what, what you do. And probably the highlight of my senior career was winning my um, ITF singles world championship with all my family in Australia being there watching me and they never had really seen me play before. Really? That has to be amazing. Well, I left when I was 18. So and my, my age difference is five years, my sister's next and then my brother. And then I have a half sister and half brother. So it was really very special to have everybody there. Um, I added a lot of nerves to me and a lot of pressure, but that was a moment that We'll, we'll go down to did, the did they have an idea that you would win? Did they come thinking, oh, she could really win this? Or were they just sort of there to support and then surprised that that happened? Well, well maybe a little bit of both. I think they knew my history. I mean, we'd won uh, gold medals in the team competition before, and I'd been in the final a number of times and not won the final. So um, I think they knew that I had a chance. And we did win the, the cup. Uh, there in Perth, Australia, and then uh, I did win the, the singles and came in, I think, semi third place in the doubles. But it was it was just great to have them all there. What a special moment to do that in front of your family. That, that I can see why that would be a great, great moment for you. I guess one of the first ones would have been obviously Billie Jean. Um, I've known her for a long, long time. I watched her play played against her, which was not a pleasant experience for me. Um, but I think just watching and, and hearing what she said and what she thought and that there was never a way that she would take no. She was always looking for the way to get what she wanted to achieve. So, so Billy's one person. Ellen Merlo, I mentioned before from uh, Philip Morris, 
very strong corporate woman um, and I got a sense of what it would be like to be in a high level corporation by watching her mm -hmm. uh, even though she was very relaxed in the tennis side of it when we had our business meetings it was uh, interesting to watch her. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the women had a great impact on me was a lady from New York, a uh, very funny Italian lady called Inez Amy. Um, I got to meet her when I started the uh, WTA Player School and Inez was one of my presenters. She was a very high level marketing person. She was the only woman that worked for NFL Films for many, many years and she was executive director of the US ski team for a number of years. And she taught me, first of all, how to laugh a lot at myself. <laughs> um, and she could tell the best stories. So, but she gave me a lot of confidence in um, because I would tag along when we did a lot of our sponsor presentations. And she taught me marketing, and that's how I got to be WTA marketing director. Was really thanks to Inez, what she taught me about um, you know the presenting to sponsors, what they were looking for, and how think outside the box. Don't just go to tennis people. Go to different people. And we negotiated a huge deal with. Uh, P&G with Pringles with the WTA, one of their biggest deals at the time. So um, she, I think, probably had one of the biggest impacts on, on me. Um, one of my doubles partners, Margaret Russo from Australia, a very classy lady. I think she made me a better person both, both on and off the court. Um, I was very uh, emotional on the court, win or lose. I was uh, not exactly the Zen person I am now. and. Uh, she just was always the same. She was a great friend whether you won or lost. And, and Margaret taught me a lot. Unfortunately, she passed away um, when very young from brain cancer, but she, uh, she stays in my mind a, a long time. And people like you, people yeah. that move into positions that were primarily held by my men. Um, and I think Florida is the leader in that situation, both in the tennis world and the business world. We have so many uh, female tennis directors at the big clubs uh, in Florida and um, a very active uh, group of women at, that uh, play tournaments. We have the Les Grand Dames tournaments. So I think there are a lot of people that players, people wanting to get into the business side of the sport, people that want to get into um, running tournaments. There's a lot of people that they can turn to, a lot of mentors that they can uh, are easily reachable. And I think that's what you need in, in this business. And of course, you've been a mentor to quite a few people, including all of us here. Uh, we hold you in such high regard. And mainly, the, you know, the marketing side that you mentioned, I've, I've always really been intrigued because most tennis professionals don't have that marketing background. And I think one of the first times I ever saw you present, it was on events and running events. And I thought, this is wonderful you know we need more of this and i uh just saw the profile we did on jennifer gelhouse and she has i think a degree in biology and i think we have all of this wonderful diverse talent among women that we can bring to the tennis space so you really are uh sort of a groundbreaker in that to bring a different skill set um than what maybe other other tennis pros has and i i think women do that we we sort of we do a lot of things and then we bring them to the things right. that we're doing and and we really kind of uh, we're, we're sort of a whole lot of, of things rolled into one a lot of times. And I think sometimes we sell ourselves short on all the, the experiences think, we have. That that sentence right there is very important for people to hear, because I think women do tend to be very humble and they do sell themselves short or they don't reach for the stars when they could very easily do that. Um, and I I learned. When I was uh, working for the WTA, people, I guess, assumed that I played a lot of tennis there, right? But I was running the tournament day in and day out. And when you're in Chicago in an indoor facility on one court, you're there from 8 a.m. until 1 a.m., right? But I also found that I loved the organizational side of it. And so when I, I had the opportunity to begin organizing USTA Florida tournaments and then uh, national tournaments and then the world championships for the ITF, I love doing that. I love the organization of it. I love getting the sponsors. I love watching the players' faces when they hopefully come to a well-run event and uh, write nice thank you letters. But I didn't know that I could or wanted to do that. But somebody like Inez and, and other people along the way um, 
you know, somebody like Kathy Woods, who took the job at uh, Lake Nona, you know, she's a, a trailblazer, first uh, person on the national board and just uh, somebody that you read her resume and you think, wow, you know, first of all, how did she get into that and why did she do it and how she stayed in it for so long? So it's most of us that get into the tennis business don't leave the tennis business. <laughs> We're in it for life. And I think it's because of the passion that we have for the sport, but also for the people around us. Yeah, I think that's well said. And um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, advocating for women. So you've always been a strong advocate for advancing women. Uh, in fact, you've been a leading voice here in Florida for quite some time. Um, and I'm, I know you were doing it long before you came to Florida. Um, in your view, speaking about Florida and sort of the tennis world here in Florida, what do you think we're doing well and where do you think we're behind and really need to kind of step up our game? As I said, I think Florida is very progressive. Um, and I think we're doing many of the right things with all the webinars, the educational opportunities. Um, we get the names of the jobs that are available out to everybody. Before it used to be a, the old boys network. Hey, you know, this job's open, call Sam and he'll, you know, you'll get that job. It doesn't happen anymore. It's, it's open to everybody. And our testing ratio for women has almost gone up to 60-40. So we're trying to get to 50-50 at least. And a lot of them are younger women that are coming into the profession. Um, and some of them don't come into the profession to be full-time uh, professionals. They don't want to be tennis directors. As you say, they have family, they have other uh, jobs or other things they want to do, but they love the sport. So I think in Florida, the, the opportunities that we've presented to everybody are readily available. But again, at the same time, Anybody who does want to progress, they have to step up. They have to uh, latch on to somebody like a Chuck Gill. You know, mm -hmm. he's my other mentor. You know, mm -hmm. I love him. Everybody loves Chuck, but but he also is a great leader. And and when you can find somebody like that, you can learn so much by the way he treats people, by the way he uh, runs his departments, and and how he exudes just the passion for the sport and also his love of people. You have to learn all of that. That doesn't always come naturally to people. I remember the first um, convention that I went to many, many years ago for USPTA. I felt very um, alone. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that many people. Um, and I knew that I was a good player and I knew that I was a good coach and I was certified and I belonged there. But again, if you're not accepted by the other people, you begin to feel, well, maybe I'm not worthy. And I think initially that was what the women felt. but. USPTA Florida, as well as USTA Florida, have made it very welcoming at every gathering that we've ever had to make sure that not just the women, but everybody are included. And, and um, again, right now, obviously, DNI is one of the, the top subjects of discussion at, at every level, but particularly in the tennis world, because we only have about 21% women in our USPTA. Um, and yet, you go to any club between uh, 9.30 and 12.30, who's on the courts? Women, Women. right? Mm -hmm. Women's leagues, women's clinics, you know, three and me, double strategy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do some hitting frenzies now, and the occasional guy will drop in just to see what it's all about, but there's a whole bunch of crazy women out there with the music blaring. <laughs> We're getting our exercise right. in. So, you know, watch out, guys. We're taking over, but... <laughs> You, you have to, first of all, feel comfortable on the court. Um, and if you're in the business, again, find somebody that you can learn from. Uh, if you have that passion, you can go a long way, but you have to, I think, really push yourself, push your achievements. Um, you have to listen and you have to learn a lot, just not online or in seminars, but also I still watch avidly the tennis channel to you know, I've been teaching a long time. Am I teaching the right style? Is, is the person that's coming to me, um, I'm teaching open stance. Who knew about open stance, you know, 25 years ago, right? Um, so I think uh, you just have to be ready to, to move with the times and to learn uh, every day you're in this business because it's, um, it's a great business to be in. 
You know, you mentioned something in your answer that really struck a chord with me. For the first time um, in my limited amount of years, I saw a job posting this past month that said, we are looking for a female director of tennis. I had never seen that. I had only seen, we're looking for a director of tennis. And this post was specific to, we want a female director of tennis. So my question for you is, a lot of times women don't step up. They don't think they have the qualifications to do a particular job. So what kind of advice would you give to women who are out there that may be seeing these job postings, but are hesitant to apply for that higher level job in tennis, whether it be at a club or maybe a management role here at, at USTA or USPTA? Well, I'm a pretty big risk taker. So I would say to people, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. You know, believe in yourself. Um, do as much as you can in the current job that you are in so that you can learn and it looks good on a resume if you've you know, given free clinics to the inner city kids and that you've been on a committee or a board or that you've learned some of the business side that you know how to do budgets that you know now you've got to know computer excel you've got to learn everything if you want to step up and be half court, off court, or completely off court. You've got to learn the business side of it right from the beginning. And um, again, I think it's just a matter of, of um, not overstepping, but just taking that risk, asking, hey, you know, I know that you've got a new program starting. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to run that program. I'd, I'd like, I feel I can bring in more kids. If I'm there, I can, I can help. Um, you know, let me run that ladies D7 team if none of the guys want to do it. I want to do that. I can relate to those women sort of thing. So you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to promote yourself because sometimes people aren't, they don't know that that's what you want to do. They're, they think you're happy doing what you're doing. And if you want something else, you've got to ask for it. I remember when we first started our tennis management initiative and I was you know, I love project management. It's just one of my side loves. I, I enjoy it. It lets me organize things. I love seeing projects come together. And I wanted to be the project manager. I knew nothing about facility management, but I was like, I'm happy to manage the project. I'll do the documents and I'll kind of compile everything. And of course, no one on the project wanted to do that. But I was like, I, I'll do it. And what I got out of that six month period of sitting in the room with people like Chuck, and Robert Hollis and, and others just sitting there and listening to the different things they were talking about was like, oh, I, I now have a better understanding of what it takes to run a tennis facility and what types of things you had to think about. Um, but I wouldn't have had that knowledge if I didn't just take a skill I had and said, hey, I'm willing to be in the room and I'm OK doing it. And sometimes I think we just have to get in the room some way or another get in the room, learn, absorb, and then you never know, a door might open for you to, you know, have a, a higher role or take on more responsibility. Well, I mean, look look where you are. You weren't a tennis player, right? So, you know, why are you running the tennis organization? It's, it's, uh, it's you were in the room. You put yourself in the room one way or the other, and they could see that you were very, very capable and uh, willing to, as you say, Take, take a step out of your comfort zone and try to learn something else. But I think that that's true of almost anything. But certainly a female has to get herself in the room. She has to stand tall. She has to speak up. She has to learn how to do presentations. She has to learn how to speak publicly. It doesn't all happen on the court. You know, I was looking at uh, just the USTA national hires, the, the last three or four. They weren't tennis people. They were business women, mm -hmm. uh, all of them women. Uh, with very strong credentials and so I, I think there are a lot of the volunteers that we have they love tennis um, they don't want to go into the business side of it they just want to help mm -hmm. wherever they can whether it's uh, working with the foundation or working with adaptive or helping the little four and five-year-old kids I mean there are a lot of people that just uh, are happy doing that and don't need to take that step up but I think we still have to get out there, whether it's through our uh, community tennis people um, or whether it's our other volunteers, recruit other volunteers to get more women in there. Um, that's what I keep saying about bringing more women into the sport itself. You know, bring a friend to the clinic and get that, get it free. 
Yeah. Bring those women in there because that's how those those teams grow. That's how your leagues grow. That's how your membership grows if you're running a club. Um, but I, I think you you if you're interested in tennis, then you have to research it. If you are interested in going more than just hitting tennis balls, if you want to do something else, then you have to read, you have to watch, you have to listen, you have to go to the meetings, you have to do other things. As you say, you've got to be in the room, otherwise nobody's going to notice you. Um, my my daughter-in-law who's here is not an athletic person. She's never had the opportunity to play sports. And I started teaching her about seven weeks ago and she is now a tennis fanatic, not every day now, two hours. I said, hey, I get paid a lot of money for this, right? <laughs> I mean, the joy of seeing the passion on her face when she steps on that court and she's learning, that's what we as teachers love to see, right? So it can be at any level, but again, you've got to put yourself out there. And, and I'm a much better tennis professional now than I was even 15 years ago, not to mention 30, 40 years ago. Um, I had to learn along the way because styles change. Um, the ages of my students changed. Uh, today I had an 88 year old as my first lesson, right? And then a 35 year old as my second lesson, right? So obviously I don't do the drills the same way. I don't teach the same way, right? But um, I just, I love watching people learn and I don't know how to get that passion across to other people without exposing them to the sport. Thank goodness for Tennis Channel, right? Mm -hmm. And for uh, webinars and everything else that if you have any interest in playing tennis, at least you have something that will draw you in. Um, not to mention Roger Federer coming back today. That was nice. Yay! Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, even if you just go down to your local tennis court and you watch a couple of people that are fairly decent hit the ball around and you think, you know, I could do that. That's great exercise. And today, with the pandemic, tennis is one of the best things you can do just to get outside and get some exercise. It's much more fun than just walking or running. It's so true. And I think the pandemic did two really wonderful things for us. Not only did it bring people in because we were a safe sport that you could do outside, but the point you raised earlier, there's now so much more available digitally than before. We were a little bit behind in the digital space and now it's like, overload there's so much out there now for tennis online and so that you know maybe the younger generations who like to learn things on youtube you know like these kids can do anything on youtube it's like oh i learned how to fix my car and i just watch some youtube videos right. and so now they're getting exposed to it in a different way which hopefully piques their interest and then they go out on the court and they're able to find a great pro like you who can well, teach them and have, make sure they have fun and they get hooked on the sport and then they volunteer for us. That's kind of how that works. <laughs> I, I think one of the hardest things for uh, women to do and maybe younger people as well is to try to define their goals, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be career goals or uh, just personal goals. Um, obviously there's a great deal of emphasis on health and fitness at the moment. And I think a lot of the younger women are certainly if they're not doing it uh, in person, they're doing things on Zoom, Pilates and uh, conditioning and Zumba, anything. There's so many different ways of staying flexible and fit and healthy. Um, and I think that's obviously a, a goal that most people have. Uh, I, I didn't have any goals when I was first starting to play tennis because tennis wasn't a business. It wasn't a career when I started to play. I thought I was going to be teaching Latin or something back in... Australia. So, um, so I think you, as you develop, you begin to develop your own goals. And, um, you know, certainly one of my, my goals was to give back to the sport, which gave me so much. That's why I wanted to help USTA Florida and be on their foundation and also uh, work with the DNI. And I'm on like four or five other task force. I seem to be on a Zoom call. Every <laughs> hour. That's why I was so confused. I didn't know whether it was you or Ramona or somebody I was talking to. Today. So, um, I just think that you have to keep growing and redefining yourself as well as redefining your goals. And if you don't know where you're going, reach out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, one of your greatest volunteers and a former um, president of USTA Florida, Nancy Horowitz, who's been a great friend over the years, she's sort of been a sounding board for me, uh, partly because of her 
crazy sense of humor, but also <laughs> she she can see the big picture. Yeah. And uh, so is uh, Jane Mills at one of the big clubs here in Florida at the Polo Club. Um, we sort of parallel our careers a little bit as far as being a director of tennis. And the same with Paula Shebb over on the west coast of Florida. There's a lot of very strong women who've been in the industry for a long time. And whenever we have a question, that's who we call, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we're there and we're there for anybody or everybody that, that wants to be into the sport. And uh, we just want more women to get involved at any level, at any level, volunteers, feeding little kids, wanting to get certified, um, presenting. You know, I, I think uh, it doesn't have to be on tennis either. You know, it can be on your, in your leadership thing. You had so many different yeah. things on, on the way to be good leaders. Yeah, I think um, that's one thing we try to say every time we do a podcast or a communication is if you want to be involved in anything, we are all very accessible. We're not sort of off floating away in some other space. Our numbers are out there. Our emails are out there. If you call us and say, I want to get involved, we'll we'll put you in something. We'll get you involved. And I know Nancy is uh, is the top of that. Right. She has brought so many people in to this organization, you know, over the 10 years that I've known her, it's just countless people that she's introduced to tennis, to us. She's a connector. She's a major connector and she's done, you know, wonderful work there. And Jean um, is another one I thought of when you were talking about events, because we, I was able to interview her for my article on growing women in tennis. and you know, why she started to do the girls 12s was because it was a bad experience and she wanted to make it better. So, you know, those are some things where we have these incredible women and um, we want more. So thank you to you, Nancy. Uh, I think you you all have really done uh, a lot of work to shift the culture and, and be so open. Before we conclude, is there anything else you would like to say to the women or the men out there who are listening to uh, and watching this video? Well, I think it's very important that you learn all about the sport. I mean, now the stretching and the uh, warm up routines and everything so you don't get injured, because if you want to stay in the sport for a long time, trust me, it's it's a little wear and tear on the body. I, I've, I've been there. Um, and if you want to learn, make sure you find a good certified professional. I know a lot of women like to take from women professionals. And you're right, there aren't that many out there, really, not everywhere. And so we're trying to make that maybe a little more accessible to everybody. But you have all those leagues at all different levels. Um, and I know the public parks now are so busy. I can't believe in my area the amount of tennis that's being played. Um, we had like seven hitting frenzies going at the same time the other day. So people are out there wanting to learn, wanting to hit a lot of tennis balls, um, and they're buying a lot of equipment. And from those people, we can get our volunteers. You know, a lot of them are playing my senior women's tournaments because I, I've seen their faces and uh, we're starting up again, hopefully at the, uh, in the fall of this year. So, um, but you know, I remember Nancy ran the all kids for the Lipton down mm -hmm. was is now the Miami Open, right? And I'm thinking, who's this crazy lady that would want to run like 200 kids? <laughs> and, and that's how I got to know her. And and um, you, you just you have to stick your neck out. You have to see somebody and say, I want I want to know that person. I want to I want to find out why she's doing that. How is she doing that? And uh, maybe I could help. And um, you know, I just keep saying I've since the age of bat and ball when I was three, I guess, until um, my age now, which I'm not saying, but I've been in tennis a long time. It's, it's a fabulous sport. And I just want more women to get involved at any level. And I'm here to help, as are you. We are both here to help. I am so grateful that you grew up next to a tennis court and you said bat and ball, and that brought you to tennis. And I'm also grateful um, that you were brought to the U.S. Uh, <laughs> via Detroit <laughs> and grateful to the WTA that you ended up here in Florida. So thank you so very much for everything that you've done for tennis over the decades. We could spend hours going over everything. You're always such a joy to talk to and you're always so gracious with your time and your guidance and advice. 
So thank you for, for all of that and for joining me today. Thank you. And thank you to USTA Florida for giving me the opportunity to grow. Thank you. You're very welcome. For those of you who are uh, watching this video, uh, please make sure to visit USTAFlorida.com for all of our videos and articles and complete coverage of Women's History Month throughout the entire month. Thank you all for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon on the court.